Hi folks, I'm Glenn. And I'm Maureen. And today on Cabin Life, we have a task to do. We've got to get into the bush to do it. So we thought we would bring you along for the adventure. Come on along for the ride. Come on. breaking branches Ooh. like a moose or something ah I mean, he was moving the trees and cracking and creaking the trees a bit but well there could be a moose in I here thought, i thought i heard something big we might have disturbed something that was uh crashed out curled up in the bush a deer or a, a moose Watch yourself down there. No, I don't think that's going to go. Do you want me to hold it? Gotta watch, it doesn't fly up when it comes. Well, that's what I mean. Do you want me to hold it? I'll cut it sideways first. Still got something to hold on to. Then I'll work on the top side. There it goes. Okay, when this goes. I think it's gonna pop, it's gonna pop way up. So, I'm gonna get ready to stand back, just in case, it's got tension on it. There it 
goes, hopefully it just falls. But it's leaning on this tree here. Oh, how about that? Look out. There it goes. Perfect. Now put that one down and cut the other one. Oh, that's too much for me to carry by myself. Okay, hold on. You want me? On what do you want me to do with this? Leave it as is. Oh yeah, I'm just trying to line up which way to go. Okay, hold on, we can make it this way. Wait. Okay, nicely done. Thank you. Starting to lose our light. Yeah. I guess we better uh, we better get moving here on this last one and haul this out as far as we can. Um. Yeah, I would. Unless you want to, unless you want to use some of these cedar poles, and we can make a little lean-to up against somewhere and start a fire and. and uh, Wait out till morning. <laughs> Do you have a ferro rod? I have a ferro rod and yeah, a lighter. Okay, you can get the rabbit. Okay. <laughs> Unless you're just going to go down to the deli and get some nice butchered rabbit, we can put that on the fire. It's in the fridge. Bushcraft your way to the fridge. Uh, crazy things people do. <clears throat> well, you know, it's really nice what we're doing. We're doing it our land at our home because when we want. Yeah, because we need to do it. Not because we're just coming up for the weekend to shoot some video so we can have a campfire on video or something. You know, we do it because that's what we want to do and we have a fire in the in the middle of a snowstorm because we can. Because we can. <laughs> we like fires and we don't mind snowstorms. So and some people think we're kind of crazy and, and whatnot, but uh, <clears throat> yeah. You know, some people don't realize that when people up in the north where it's cold, um, doing stuff in the snow is just part of life. It's just part of life. And you get used to it because if we stayed in every time it was <laughs> If we cold, stayed in every time the weather wasn't cooperative. <laughs> we'd be inside for like six months. <laughs> you know where the term cabin fever came from, eh? <laughs> From, so, the, from the ones that didn't want to go out into the weather, they got stir crazy inside of the cabin. <laughs> so, yeah, so we've just adapted to working in the snow. And with the work we've done for the last 
30 or 40 years between employment work and our business work, we worked outside. Yeah. So yeah. it's just, for us, it's a norm. <laughs> it's not something that we have to do. It's not something that um, we do it because we think it'll look cool sitting in a snowstorm having sausages. It's just, um, if snow starts, then that's just the way it goes. You contend with it, make the best out of a not so fantastic situation. But you know what? We, we enjoyed that snowstorm and having a fire there. It was quite relaxing. And, and uh, as Maureen said, you know, she spent 30 years out in the, in the field doing assessment properties and, and, uh, and looking at land and, and all that. And I'm a nature recordist, musician, and spent all kinds of time in the bush and in the canoe. And we slept in the canoe many, many, many nights on lakes that lakes that we were familiar with. We knew where the deadheads and rocks and pitfalls were and all that stuff. But um, so we were very accustomed to pulling up on shore if we wanted to and start a little campfire and have some, some coffee and a, a bite to eat and go back into the canoe. And we'd have blankets with us and morning would curl up in the, in the bow of the canoe there and with a nice pillow and uh, throw a blanket over top of her to keep the mist and, and dew off. And uh, I'd be sitting there at the at the other end of the canoe on my back on a nice pillow and looking up at the stars would have the headphones on she'd have headphones on we'd have the recorder going and just listening to the night sounds the wolves all the loons and that was that was just part of life and we we did that right through the summer and into the fall and and then finally in the mornings when the sun would come up we would we would uh I could feel the ice forming on the on the sides of the canoe uh, from the dew freezing overnight, and uh, that's when I knew okay, well, it's probably getting a little bit cool that night to to be continuing on, you know. So that was pretty much we knew that the water would be freezing at any time. That gets into a bit of a <clears throat> more of a dangerous kind of situation when you're dealing with that. So so uh, you, but know. you know what the scenery the scenery during those times is some of the most beautiful scenery that we have captured mm -hmm. on film. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people, uh, summer canoes, uh, don't get a chance to see that stuff because uh, their canoe is already packed away for, you know, four to six weeks before that time. So, you know, I'm talking, you know, October and uh, early November. <clears throat> and uh, Well, I was going through our files the other day and our latest canoe trip was November 3rd and I, we made an attempt to go to Algonquin Park on November 10th that year. That's when we were visiting and following that loon family. Yeah. We wanted to see if the baby, the small baby, was going to make it off the lake or not. And uh, so we kept on going as long as we could. And the logging road we were going in, the old access road to the park was blocked off several times. and Snow all over the place and ice was forming in the back bays. And uh, that was our last trip. But we wanted to make sure that that, see if that loon got off the lake. You have to look for the loons of Algonquin Park. And uh, loons of Algonquin Park, and, and uh, check out that video. It's a one hour docu diary documentary that uh, we made. And uh, you come along for the ride there. Really nice. Lots of night paddles and beautiful scenery. Anyway, uh, we better get back to this here. Just let you know we are dressed for the occasion. I have layers of clothes on. I've got my hoodie and I've got my, uh, this coat, that this jacket that you see me wearing all the time is an old jacket that I've had for years and years. I've taken this canoeing with me in the, in the late fall. Nice little windbreaker, nice to put on at night. And uh, I use it around the campfire as well. It's got a few uh, spark holes and whatnot in it, and uh, so I call it my bush coat. Um, I use it for, for going out in the bush to cut wood and, and do that kind of stuff. And sometimes it's a little warm for me, but I'd rather have this along with me, and then I can always take it off if I get a little, a little too warm. But it's great to put back on uh, should I get a chill or whatever. It's a good windbreaker as well. And I've got my snow pants on, and I have uh, 
my uh, joggers underneath of that and uh, some long johns as well so i got layers on there and i've got my my leather my leather gloves here and, and uh, nice and sturdy and, and they're quite warm too and of course i got my i have my uh a, a toucan under my hoodie and my ball cap and his ball cap my canoe cap actually is what I he's it. waiting to go canoeing <laughs> He wears it all the time. Well, it's, it's good in the winter because when the snow falls off the trees, walking through the bush and snow falls, it's, it's a bit of a protector for my eyes and, and the snow doesn't get on my glasses and um, make my glasses get all wet and foggy and steamy and all that stuff. So, And, and what's your fashion show for the day? What my are you, what are you sport? Show? She's sporting in the cedar grove today <laughs> on Cabin Life Cedar Grove. Maureen is sporting. Well, I've got my, I never do up my zipper because I like, I dress in a lot of layers and I like leaving my coat open. i got the bib snow pants and, oh, a fleece shirt, my favorite shirt. Have you ever noticed? I always have this on, kind of like your hat. Yeah, well, that's a, this, 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 this gray sweater thing, yeah. I, I, that's yeah. one of my favorites too. And a turtleneck and a shirt under that and a few layers of pants and long johns and so uh, i'm definitely warm and my good old green boots yep so my, my boots are are also uh quite high <laughs> and they're uh rubber they're rubber really good rubber that doesn't crack or anything in the well they are rubber yeah they, actual rubber so they're they won't, not they won't not, crack under extreme not, cold right they're not vinyl no and they've so. got beautiful, really good warm liners in them as well. Uh, nice warm fit, but they're not too tight. Uh, if the boots are too tight, you can get cold feet real easy, eh? So, and they're made in Canada. Made in Canada, eh? Made in Canada, eh? So, and, yeah, so, all right, we better get on. We're losing our light here. I'm going to cut this last one down. And then, uh, you don't want to stay in the bush tonight? <laughs> Actually, we don't have our we don't have our little pack with us. Uh, if we had our pack with us, we'd have a tarp and a little bit of food and some water and and all of that stuff. And staying in the bush here, it wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't be too bad, and we could just carry on from where we left off in the morning. But I think I'm going to cut this last one down, and we'll haul it to the place where the other spot the other ones are, and uh, and then uh, head back to the cabin, and uh, we'll pick it all back up tomorrow. That's the way she goes. Uh, you make do with what you got and uh, you plan ahead. Okay, well, we'll cut this last one down and we'll be on our way. That's it. Wow, what a great time of day. The sun is just going down. Now we've got some wood for the fire ready to go. Time to warm up with a hot chocolate. Over the cabin campfire.
Well, honey, let's get some hot chocolate on the go. That sounds like a plan. Holes made there, we can have our hot chocolate. I'll throw a bit more wood on after that. More on fire. Chocolate. Hey guys, I just want to bring up a, a, an issue that it's been bothering me for some time now. I keep hearing incidents of wildlife that are being struck by uh, passing cars on uh, roadways and highways adjacent to uh, wilderness reserves, um, parks, you know, along the, the roadsides. Uh, people seem to be attracted to the wildlife. Of course they are, you know, to want to get pictures and so forth when when they see something. And so they uh, park their cars on the side of the road and, and get their cameras and, and they try to go in close and, and uh, take pictures of the wildlife. And some people in their in their zest for acquiring a good photo will often throw out handfuls of food to the wildlife and as the wildlife comes in closer to get the food you know they get their wonderful you know photos it's uh, bothering me because a lot of these animals have become accustomed to or habituated to humans feeding them uh, treats and morsels of food and uh, the wildlife learns to get their sustenance in this fashion once they've uh, learned about getting a food source they'll often come back and try to repeat that uh, same activity so when uh, people feed the wildlife on the sides of the roads and anywhere for that matter the wildlife learns that uh, that's where they can get their food from unfortunately it's resulted in many uh, fatalities and uh, injuries uh, to the wildlife where cars are uh, uh, passing by and uh, the wildlife is coming out to get a morsel of food and, and they end up getting uh, struck by the, the vehicle. There are crowds of people that stop in their cars and, and uh, go out and along the sides of the highway and uh, they'll take pictures of a moose or a deer or of a fox or a fox family it's really sad to uh, hear about these fatalities and injuries and people don't realize i think that um, they they could be uh, contributing uh, to uh, the detriment of nature so when it comes to situations like this you know when when wildlife is inadvertently harmed i sometimes wonder if it's better to just be a witness to the natural beauty instead of trying to get a photo to share it the love and passion for nature and the desire that humans have to share it is so powerful that many will do almost anything to get a photo instead of realizing that this very drive and act of passion may be to the detriment of the very thing we're trying to show love toward. My personal motto is, nature should be appreciated, shared, and respected. It should be preserved, cared for, and protected for future generations. And if we could abide by these precepts, humans and nature would coexist in harmony. Observe at a respectable distance and never feed wildlife, no matter how much you think you may be helping. Nature has fed herself since the beginning of time, and our effort to help is simply an interference in nature's law.